and so most of it then almost uh, calls for a complete rethinking of that process and assessment of quality along the way. I also wonder if there's baggage in the old terms and terminology of QA that QA's allowed itself to be uh, fit to the fit, fit near the end when it, at, in essence, especially in an integration fashion, it should be very near at and at the beginning. No, that that's that's a great point. Um, we've we've been trying to come up with a new term for Q and Q and Q QA, right? Because the second you mention Q and Q QA, even to some of you guys that are in the room right now, it's a yeah, it's something that I know we need to do, but here's the other stuff that we need to do first, right? Versus flip flipping that and saying. You know, QA needs to be picked first because they will ensure that, you know, when specs are being de defined or user stories are being defined, that um, they're actually, that there's no gaps there and there, right? Which it'll, it takes a two, a two minute chat between the business and the dev team to fix those type of problems versus if we're not engaged at that phase. You could go weeks towards the end of your sprint, which that's probably what most of you guys are doing right now. And then you throw it across to the Q Q QA team, and then they're like, well, you, you know, are you guys sure this is what you really needed, right? Um, so QA really, it's, it's what is another term that we can call it, right? I mean, what are, what are y'all's thoughts on, on that? I, I can see a lot of people you know, nodding and, and what I'm reading from it is is that you guys probably, I know someone's tried dying there. What no, do you, what no, do you no, think? Just, I, I've seen this movie before. I, I have an operations background. I started my career out of tech and manufacturing. So total quality management, Yeah. right, is really what you're talking about here. Not just at the, it's the last step before you launch or have a beta, right? It's, it's not the afterthought. So really you're talking PQM. So manufacturing adopted this, right? The whole yeah. thing. Sigma services do this with total quality management as well. But when you say that, then you've got the well, that's a lot of administration, it's a lot of costs, they're going to slow me down. So you have to balance that as having sold these programs to different industries. You have to sell that with what's the value proposition of doing this? Mm -hmm. So is it better, faster, cheaper in terms of development? Can you actually support that value prop and have a better you know, quality product? Mm -hmm. So that's just lessons learned from having to sell it, you know, quality, which is an abstract. <coughs> into different applications, different industries, different functions. So yeah. thanks for letting me share. Yeah, yeah. no, it makes sense. A part of the uh, the challenge, and I, I've always, uh, in dealing with my students, I always talk about the, the phenomenon of the first five minutes. We usually blow most projects in the first five minutes because we bring in assertion or assumption that we don't hold or we should have attended to. And a part of the discipline and practice from, rooted from QA are needed up there. But the problem is with total quality management tries to get an overarching right. governance. We can't do that. You'll right. you'll fail in doing that. So what we need are the principles underlying that to be a part of all stages and early stages in that process. So a part of that renaming is a remix kind of type of story. It's unbundling those things, bringing those principles forward and then recasting them into integrating into whatever development or integration disciplines are are present, and that's that's a part of the challenge is is taking the essential learnings and principles there, but almost you have to drop the QA uh, uh, QA baggage on it as well because you're after an efficacy of the system initially the uh, and. I, I need to know that that system's going to have its impact that I want it to have, and yeah. it has, that has to start from the beginning. Yeah. You know, the other thing that I find a lot of IT uh, shops and a lot, of a lot of our clients struggle with, and, and I think this is part of why QA is still behind the times uh, from, from my standpoint, is, is who owns Q and QA, right? Um, is there a separate QA function? You know, do you have a, a VP of Q and QA? You know, and in in a lot of cases, it's kind of. 
and sports is a big thing to me. That's what brought me to the States many years ago. But it's kind of, we're kind of like, in a lot of cases, we're kind of like that kid that um, is one of the last to get picked when you're picking two teams. And it's like, well, well, we'll, we'll just take, take them type, type of thing, right? And in a lot of cases, we fall under the dev side of things, right? Which, um, which, which is fine. I mean, we, we can be there, but I see QA being a separate, you know, if you want a true IV and V function, and if, if a CIO wants, or even a CEO or CFO wants a true IV and V function, um, I, I believe the best place for QA is, is having its own uh, having its its own team and having a direct line to the CIO to the CFO even from the standpoint of you know the CIO and CFOs are usually button heads right because of costs right costs going up and part of what we should be doing part of what your QA function should be doing is making sure that the money that the CFO and your business is spending, you're getting the most from it. And, and that goes from, you know, whether you're using in, internal dev teams or external third parties, and, you know, making sure that the processes are in place that you're getting the most from it. Just a slightly self-serving comment, but part of our connection to this is helping firms address this. When you talk about the CIO and the CFO, what Carly does is helps firms take that money and capture the R&D tax credit for that. So there are tax credits to support this cost specifically that offset some of this. The government's incentivizing research and development and capturing this cost that we can talk about later, but when you talk about cost being a detriment to doing it, there are mechanisms for offsetting that. Yeah. And this, this slide will kind of go in, and, and Ben and I spent a lot of time with this, is it's taken QA from, and I'll use my laser pointer here, it's really cool, you know, from this point where we usually get engaged, I'd say in about 80% even now, to taking Q, QA and, and flipping it up upside down, right? And having us really driving, helping drive things where we kind of become the P, PMO's best friend. Right, because we're helping them, you know, drive through different <coughs> phases, our stages, our tasks, or whatever it is. What What do you think about that, Ben? Well, I, I, I think here again, the uh, key is to step away from our, our twentieth century mo models that uh, encumber us in thinking forward, and um, probably our our highest crime would be trying to keep QA as one function. And uh, I, I, whether you name it, however you rename it or chop it up, it's a remix process. And so the principles that are in, that are exhibited well in those processes of, of QA need to be visited at different stages and earlier. And especially in the case where you're dealing with integration over development. And the reality is that our budgets are shifting CapEx to OpEx. Are, we're shifting from development to integration, and that requires us on a continuous basis to make quality assessments all along the way. And I, I, I think we would be harmed by trying to push it as a QA per se. So we need to unbundle it, take pieces out, out and decide how to make that case early on. Uh, we should start with, with quality. We should start with efficacy. We should start with impact assessments and, uh, and not end with those things. Mm -hmm. And all too often, uh, we see it as the final rendering. And frankly, the costs are higher that way. We can, uh, because we make, we make too many mistakes that we have to undo. A famous uh, computer science uh, professor, I used to work with Edgar Dijkstra, who was a real idiot, um, uh, butthead but uh, uh, as a person but he did say something that stuck with me uh, and that was that we have debugging tools because we've got bugging tools and all too often uh, that our systems and processes create and render and tolerate bad things 
and bad decisions all along the way and then we uh, we have tools to work with and fix them how do we start migrating those principles of QA up earlier in that series mm -hmm. of spirals and uh, integrating circles mm -hmm. now that, that's a very good point there now the other couple of things that I want to touch on during this section is one is, is cost right um, you know, we, we talk to a lot of cl costs. I'd say our clients, and I say about, I'd say 10 out of 10 times when we get on the phone with, with clients, they're like, oh, wow, we are dying. We really need you guys. Um, and, you know, then, Leon, let's put a statement of work together. And then, you know, we give them a statement of work. And then it, it gets pushed back in a lot of cases because they're not convinced of what they're getting for the cost, right? Um, and, one of the things a lot of our clients struggle with is the balance and you know what balance what do we need based on the project scope based on, on who's doing the coding based on time frames you know how are we going to test this how are we going to get it done by this the drop dead date that they all have right um, and in a lot of cases they'll 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 try doing things um, in in house or they'll try throwing a lot of bodies at it but in a lot of cases that actually ends up costing them more right so I want to ask you guys how do you what is y'all's viewpoint on that and um, from a from a cost standpoint are, are do you feel like you guys are prepared to invest in that QAE or whatever that name is function and um, so to do it right up front versus you know there's case studies out there about how much more it costs you Right, once you go live, if you find a bug, right, the further you go down, it costs you more and more. And by the way, that's the first time you've heard y'all mentioned in a in a in an Irish brogue. <laughs> I will say I played soccer down at Georgia Southern many years ago, so I, I was in the deep south when I got here first. So, <laughs> so what 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 do you guys think of that? Yeah, and you know, one of the things that's helping from a cost standpoint is is the QA, QA function is becoming more of a tech, technical function, and we actually have people who have coding skills now, which you know they're kind of crossing over to the dark side now, right? So, um, and that's part of what we're going to show you guys to, to today is 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 getting to a point where you you know where you're going to really start to get your return back, right? Is you have to lay the groundwork, right? You have to define your test cases. You have to define the steps. You have to run them by hand first to get to a point where you can start to script them, right? And then the, the end goal is how, how can we have a kind of a CI SDLC where when dev teams de deploy the code, we can kick off scripts. You know, the scripts will tell us whether it's good enough to go into a for formal QA role so you're saving, you know, it's taking you a fraction of the time. So those costs are, are are coming down as you go through each cycle. But it's are you are you ready to are you prepared to invest in the upfront cost to get there, right? So it might cost you all right this year. It might cost you a little bit more than what you know you would have liked to. But you know what? The next two, three, four, five years, you're going to gain that back ten, ten, tenfold, right? And it's and it's convincing. Um, you know, it's it's convincing everybody from the CIO to the CFO, right, and even the CEO in some cases of you know, this is this is worth spending on because this is what we're going to gain from it, right? Well, a, a part of the uh, the challenge I've seen is one one thing I've seen with just startups in general and development that 
especially the technical people, are uh, ready to promote capabilities. And the, one of the biggest crimes I've seen in, in uh, patterns of innovation is people promote capabilities and not solutions. And it's tough to get them to understand that, that the buyers, the customers, buy solutions, not capabilities. And you have to start on, on that side of it. And a part, a part of the issue and opportunity with QA is a discipline that says QA is not the agent of, of the technology of the capability side of it. It's the agent of the solution side. And that's where the, the bridge of your C-level suite comes into play. I am truly the agent of, of their aspect because that's where the return is. That's where the benefits are. That's where the impacts are. <clears throat> and that's a part of it, that's been a part of it too. It's viewed as a part of the development process instead of an agency mm -hmm. of the user community and an agency of the uh, uh, impact assessment. Very, very, very well said. All right, I'm getting the wrap up for our section. Uh -oh. So any, any questions, any but other But the most comments? important, I'm sorry, go, we're out of time. Go ahead. <laughs> we'll let Ben have the last say. So you guys, you guys have any questions? Yeah, no, that, that's a great point, and I don't want to go over too much here or I get in trouble. Um, but it's a very important point is that another role of a QA function is to sit with that dev per whoever's coding and the business team and ask those questions up front, right? From an end user standpoint, right? You know, is, is, is that going to help you, you know, do your job, right? Is that going to give the client what they need, right? And that's the type of. That's the type of team that you want to build, type of IT team where you have that back and forth. But it's it's happening, as it's just hap, hap, happening as part of the everyday work, right? And versus I'm going to do my piece, then I'm going to give it to you, and then you can give it to Johnny or whatever it is. Is it's working together? And my whole thing is the QA function should be that glue that's keeping all those pieces together, right? So, any other questions, comments? No, no, no. You I... good? Here for hours and hours. So, um, what I will do is I'll, I'll just read this. You know, if you don't make time to do it right, you must have time and money to do it over. It's a very true statement, and I've seen it many times. What I'm going to do is I'm going to hand it over to our technical team here. Chris Stretch is going to drive it. <laughs> I'm going to hand it over here to Chris. Well, I, think, uh, I certainly think last word is uh, it's important to look at the part of this next phase and evolution and disruption of, of QA.
point I did want to make before I move forward, the question about um, where do you see the value, where's the cost savings, um, and that I'm doing some e-commerce work suite that runs 45 scenarios in 12 minutes, and this is all UI testing very close to the user. If someone could introduce me to a single QA that could run that, and this is against multiple environments, I would love to meet them. I have yet to run into that, but it just shows you sort of the power of the type of testing. Now this is a very small demo, but I think the message is quite clear. I mean, the most modern technology we have right now is smartphones or portable devices in general. The same automation that I'm going to show you here on these phones, you could actually use on a smartwatch like Ben has or any other smart device that you may own. So what we're actually going to show you is a pretty, pretty full continuous integration life cycle. Um, Aaron's going to commit a piece of code and it's going to render a change and then we're going to simultaneously test on both of these mobile phones. Um, they're both running the Android operating system and the reason that I picked this is this is a large percentage of the client base of anyone that has an external facing website you can access on a mobile phone. So it's approximately, I think, 60 to 70% of the market share, depending on where you get your numbers. But um, you can't clearly see it. So what's running on both phones right now, I chose the uh, Home Depot mobile site because I thought it was an interesting one. It's an e-commerce site. We're going to enter a SKU into their search field pull up a rake of all things because it was just a nice object I thought to pick. And you can see it more clearly on the, uh, the larger phone here, but it's pulled the rake up, it's validating the image, and now it's scrolling down to the description page, opening the dropdown for this and verifying three different items. So I think it's the, um, it'd be the skew, the handle length, and then like weight or something like that. So just simple, straightforward fields that you would validate. Now, the test have completed, it'll kick out a report. That's your integration testing right there. Now, what you've just seen is parallel mobile testing, and this is the closest to a user experience you could get without putting this device into an end user's hand. I mean, that's, that's it. And for testing, to me, that's sort of the, the holy grail, the Mount Everest of being able to say, okay, I'm just barely away from where the user is. So if something were to go wrong, say the image doesn't load correctly or something like that, you can very easily tell. Um, you can do image-based validation and things like that. Um, so that was the demo here. Now what I want to talk you through is the continuous delivery process. Many of you may be familiar with this, some more so than others. Um, so what we just witnessed was a code change that went into a version control system and what we use there is Bitbucket. Some of you may use that or you may use SBN or something else. Then our open source CI tool picked this up, which is a, um, a Jenkins server that was set up in the cloud. And from the CI tool, then the um, tests were triggered on the mobile phones. And that's our automation environment right now. So in a real world scenario, what you would see that test would ideally run before it ever makes it to exploratory testing. So the idea would be you only spend time QAing a viable build. So there's no major defects. You can run through your major workflows, any key things that you need to see. And at a current client, the way the test I was talking about are set up, once this viable build goes to the QA environment, the entire regression suite is run while they're doing exploratory testing. So they get all of the information on the pre-established scenarios while they're doing exploratory. So you're getting even more bang for your buck because it's going while someone's testing in the background. That's, I would say that's a very efficient use of time. Cost-wise, again, you can do all of this with open source tools or you can mix and match some paid for tools that have maybe a better UI so you can move a little faster. That's kind of a cost benefit analysis that we would love to help anybody with if there are questions. So okay. the automated acceptance testing is that a framework that you know anyone can adapt based on either the Selenium framework or what is their 
Um, it depends on what you want to use. Um, personally, I've written Selenium code. I've used Wergold partners with RunnerX. I've used their tool. You can use any tool that you want to there. I mean, the key in a perfect setup like this would be to have a, um, an automated acceptance environment that's separate from QA. So it's your gateway to deploying to QA so you don't fail before. Because the worst thing for me, the worst experience I ever had, I started a manual QA. I would get builds where I was testing a new feature, everything would be great. We'd start a regression cycle and then it would fall apart. And it's like, we have this great new feature, but we have to go back and fix something from Here, before. Let me add to that, uh, add some to it goes, you know, you can't go, you know, we're all born, you know, we crawl before we walk, we walk before we run, you know, we run before we sprint. In today's, I, you know, 99% of the clients that we are talking to, they're barely crawling as if they want to sprint the next day. Um, and it's important to put a QA roadmap in place. And that's part of that higher function of, of what we're trying to bring to the table from a QA role standpoint is, you know, if this is how we're doing it now, we have an end goal in mind and a time frame of what we want to go here. This is how we're going to get there, right? And, and there's things you can track throughout that process where it can clearly show the return that you're getting and actually put down. But you, you have to be prepared time and, and money up front to get there, right? I'd say 10 out of 10 clients, or I've not just clients, but people that I've seen it where they're not prepared to invest that money to fail. And, and I stand by that 100% of the time. But if, you know, every client in Butchwood that we've been with for 11 years, we've been able to get them to where they want to get. And if you have that road map in place, Oh, it's fine. It's fine. Quick question. The type of clients you guys have, are they people that are already good and they want to get better? Or are they people that they've just been burned so many times they have to put something in place just to be operational? Where do you guys play? Who's adopting you guys right now? Um, I'll, I'll have to say most, I mean, we've had clients, we've had start, start, startup clients up to clients that are in the $2 billion, $2 billion mark. Have to be upfront and say I've never seen anybody that's doing it good, and they're all struggling, <laughs> and, and and that's why they're bringing us in. It's kind of a good thing, and but what I will say, everybody, whether you're small or large, are struggling with the exact same thing. You, you'd be amazed, you know, how a start startup business and a two billion dollar business where you would expect to have better profits and that they're nearly. Exactly. So the maturity is the same. Yeah. What are they struggling with? And what is that thing that? Um, they're struggling with um, how do I? Okay, we'll start and just start start up businesses, right? And um, I've got a dev team. They're doing their own testing, or, or in some cases, the CEO is coming in doing the testing, <laughs> or they're having business people. So what it is is they're having people who aren't one who aren't trained and two really don't want to be the testing piece of it and then the, the, the common thing whether you're two billion billion or, or smaller is it's how do I build a test function? Where where does that fit? You know, who should that QA group be reporting to? Right? How can I start to script my test case? You know, what what tools should should I be using? And um, you know uh, were you you know in a lot of cases we're we're, we're using off Sure, but you know we know we're not. Well, one, we're, we're not actually sure what we're getting, and you know we we need we need to know that every dollar we're spending is is we're getting a return on it. So these would be the common questions we have: Do I hire or do I bring a third-party group in like you guys to, to be that function for us? And because everybody, including ourselves, finding good talent right now in this space is very, very, very hard. Very, very hard. You, you, you can find people that come in and hit on keys, right? And and uh, you know, run stuff. But it, it takes a special mindset to really play that QA function the way that you guys need it to to, to play. So, did that help to answer? Yeah, I would say just summarize where does the test function fit? Um, what tools actually? Are there? Are there you know that one? I would say. 
started to figure out some better leading tools on different aspects that now we can all agree, like you mentioned Selenium, you know, this is the best one or this is the best one in particular case. Is there something like that that we can refer to? Like, for instance, and I don't want to take up too much of your time, but <laughs> one of the clients that actually, I think Chris is the one that's worked with, with these guys, we went where they were struggling with a lot of stuff. Well, one of them was their re regression testing was taking up to two weeks to run. And we were able to kind of put a framework in, in place, you know, script some of it, put smoke testing in place, put this in place, and a two week time frame span to a two hour type of a time frame was it? Um, depending on what, from dev to QA? Oh no, it's it's much less now. I would say it's twenty two minutes, I believe. Yeah, so I mean that I mean that that shows you, you know, you, you do you know, and this client's doing three builds a day. So you you know, X number per week. You know, you add those figures up and that's value proposition. Well, we probably impact ten different cost areas, either directly at the project level or the PMO level across multiple projects. Yeah, and then from a time standpoint, you probably impact 15 oh, different about time it. parameters. Just that one example. Yeah. Right. yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and then you put rework on that. Yeah. And then from a quality standpoint, which isn't defined what quality is the output, there's probably five dimensions that you guys improve the output. Yeah. The deliverables, right? Yeah. So if you can start to quantify that, I mean, I was hoping to hear, hey, I can, you know, in terms of rework, we only made rework by 15%. I'll look higher than that. Okay. Well, that, you know, so if, if one of your challenges is why do this, leading with that, you know, the three value propositions mentioned, right? You, you talk to all, you have to get all the wires around the table, the CFO and the CIO, yeah. right, to have one message. And then how you operationalize it, you guys have the operation, you know, yeah. the model. Yeah. Then it's like, do we integrate it? You know, I was thinking agile development, I'm not a developer, but I know one. Yeah. On agile development, how does this integrate in with that, that approach where the mindset is, better, faster, get it out yeah. the door, and then we'll, we'll clean up at the end. So it's, it's all that just needs to be kind of put together, if you will. Well, in that case, the uh, Agile, right, I'm, I'm sorry, the I'm sorry. Agile frameworks that everybody wants to get to, but no one's doing it exactly the same way. The biggest issue with that is the backlog, right? Because we find things, right, and instead of fixing it in the current sprint, it's like, oh, we'll put it on the backlog, backlog. So at the end of, you have this massive backlog of stuff that, you know, is, is so you have to manage that, right? You have to manage that, not, not just at the end, but as you're going through it, right? And you have to have a way to measure, if we're not hitting, if we're not taking care of X number of things in every sprint, we're never gonna meet whatever that date is, right? So, so those are the types well, of things. Having that ratio of what goes in the sprint versus what's the backlog, having those ratios, yeah. and say we can diminish that to balance it out. The best way to answer your question, I think, is a very simple concept, um, a feedback loop. So if you implement a solution like I've been talking about, it would eliminate time to get a response. So a developer could know that there is an issue much earlier than waiting three people down the chain or hours or anything like that. It could be much, much quicker. And the question would be, how much does that represent the total project cost? Oh, I actually... Total project cost. You're leading the presentation. It's like you knew what I was going to talk about. So I actually do have a discussion of time slide somewhere. Well, technical difficulties. Oh, verbally? Um, I don't know the figure off the top of my head. Oh, well, I guess I can talk about tools and then we'll talk about time in, in a minute. Um, so as far as the best tool, that's a fallacy that there is a best tool for any single job because in the end, the tool is only good as the user you're putting behind it. That is a fact. If you were to put me behind a forklift right now, <laughs> I might have some trouble. But if you put me behind a car, that'd be easy. It's more familiar. So same thing. You could take somebody who is great in Java, put them with a development language like C Sharp, they would get it, but it would be slow. So tool-wise, it really takes an educated person. I would say almost any automation tool could be used correctly in a great way by the right person. Is there one that's good for everybody? Selenium is very technically heavy, 
So cost-wise, you would spend much more on engineers. If you use something that was more UI friendly, you could take QAs and you could actually convert them into like pseudo automation engineers. They could learn some code and then they could actually grow that way. So you wouldn't have to grab developers to turn them into automation engineers. Which one was that? Um, Renorex is a UI tool. It's one that I love. I use it every day. Um, I and we're gold partners. So Melissa would be. R A N O R E X. But it's it's a fun tool. Um, Melissa can set something up. She has great relationships with uh, what is it? Their salesman. Yeah, right. Well, yeah, Joe. I know Joe. I've never met any of the other salesmen. He's amazing. Oh, oh, okay. All right. Now for the very last slide, which was a thought I wanted to leave everyone with. So what I'm showing you here would be time saved per day and the total per year. Now, this graphic would represent um, approximately 10 builds a day. So we could say a quarter of an hour, 15 minutes per build per person. Now, this is based on one person wanting, running one test. And as far as I know, that's the capability of a single user if you were to manually regress or do anything that way. So this scales much more, like the two mobile tests that we showed you. If you were to give that to a QA to run through, they would have to have the manual device, they would have to go through and do all of those operations. So you're losing a lot because they would be dependent on two technologies. And what I've seen to get around efficiencies like this that you get with automation is cutting corners, doing, oh, well, I tested it on a desktop resized to the correct sizing. That doesn't exercise the OS or the actual end user again. That's why we chose to show you mobile devices. That's something you could really see out there. It's something you probably have in your pocket right now that you would spend, you probably spend more time that with that than you do spouses, friends, <laughs> anything else. I mean, that's the reality. That's where the business is. Now, I know I love to talk about mobile, but the same exact principles you could apply to enterprise applications or anything else that you can dream of. There's no real limitation as far as how this principle can be applied. And I didn't put a dollar figure up there because, you know, there is a salary range. So you could take your lowest paid employee and do a calculation simply based off of time. Or you could take somebody who's paid a lot and do the same thing. Back to my comment before we left the hard right? The bigger number is better.
case study that we put together was we were involved in a project several years ago where uh, the CIO called me up and said, you know, we've got this critical project, we're failing, we're way behind schedule, you know, and their mix is they had an internal, small internal group, and they had up to 40 offshore people doing their tests and tests and So, and he, he's like, no, I really need your help here, right? So, uh, long story short, we were able to get engaged, and we put a team of, of eight people, which included, um, it actually included five of his own team and three of our, 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 of our consultants. And we were able to show him through real-time KPIs, not just thinking real data, that the, the eight people that were on-site, on shore, were doing like three to four times as much as an offshore person. So when you when I sat down with him and boiled down, just did this simple math, okay, you know, you have a team of five, they're costing you X, and our consultants are costing you Y. You add X and Y together, it's still a lot less than what you, you're, you're paying, right? But it's the perception, it's the sticker price, right? They don't see that we can save you, I mean, that's per test. We have clients that are running 2,000 tests in a regression cycle. So when you put all those figures together, put the dollar behind it, you know, and then you get an o and tax credit, you know, it's, it's a no-brainer. Okay, one final thought that I wanted to leave everyone with is um, we all have the concept of key employees, people that have specific product knowledge that, oh, if they walked away today, that would really hurt. If it's in an automated script, if someone walks away, it lessens the blow. I wouldn't say that they're not valuable knowing the system, but if you take that knowledge, put it into your automation, then it decentralizes critical pieces that you have to test, which is, I don't like to think that I'm replaceable or people are replaceable, but I also know that you just can't hold everything in your head and be that one person. It's just not good for business. Like, I think I want to add on to that automation because I run an automation. Mm -hmm. So automation is not a one-time effort. It's, it's a continuous Correct. effort. So I think the bit that all the upper management has is once you implement automation, that's it, then you know, you're all done, and it's all automated, so we don't need it. It's a continuous maintenance that is required, and resources are required to keep the scripts up to date. Mm -hmm. And again, that's it cool. also involves a stable environment. There's a challenge. I've seen <laughs> yeah. it. We have thousands of automation scripts. Mm -hmm. However, they will fail if your environment is not stable, if your data is not flowing through. That's the best great. data management and environment are critical pieces for a successful automation. Automation. That's why I have I two hats. Not, yeah. So that's something that is not visible when we when we say automation is good. Well, yeah, it's not singly scripts. I mean, I have to split my time doing what would traditionally be considered DevOps work as well. That's why a lot of the things I talk about, I have hands-on experience from zero. Like I said, this solution we showed you, it was nothing. We built it in a week. So that's taking a server building a cloud server in our office and showing you everything we've done here. Yeah, so I've, I've got to give huge props to these guys. They came to us a couple of weeks ago, a week and a half ago, and, and started this. And, and this goes beyond the QA world. <laughs> they got into dev, I think, to server, to DevOps, to setting up the code control, I mean, all this stuff they set up. So One thing I'd like to add is the, um, the best tools and the best methods against the wrong channels is a, uh, uh, something we always have to be wary against, that we can resolve problems for an existing architecture that might be in transformation. Uh, I em embarrass my colleague here, Nick Gershenhorn, who re represents that millennial and Gen Z community that is shifting, uh, uh, he's with uh, Rody and, and folk, uh, entities like Rody that are, are emergent also in, in uh, sharing economy and peer-to-peer -peer connections. 
uh, dominant channels there are in bots and chatbots and structures that as you move away from social media connects into uh, into connects that are bot related a AI oriented and others our testing methods have to accommodate that and when we look at those that kind of migration making sure we're not again, solving 20th century problems or even early 21st century problems, but we're addressing and facing that volatile market of, of how folks interface with our services uh, going down the road. Other than that, I have no opinion. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I want to just thank everybody again for coming, you know, fighting through morning traffic. And real quick, would love to just go around the room and, and introduce yourselves since we do have a somewhat of an intimate <coughs> group here and you might want to connect afterwards or exchange um, information and keep learning from one another on how to do best practices with this.